I want to show you something. This Chinese city looks like it was abandoned after an apocalypse. But in reality, no one has ever lived there at all. There are thousands of unfinished apartments, a theme and water park, hotels, shops, and restaurants. Everything was just left alone and empty. And this isn't a unique example. So why would someone drop such a costly project? And why these ghost cities in China might be the beginning of the biggest real estate crisis the world has faced so far. So how did China came to this point in the first place? Its economy relied heavily on a strong real estate sector and everything seemed great for a long time. The housing market created employment opportunities and allowed China expanding to middle class to preserve and grow their wealth. At the same time, local governments had income from land sales as a crucial source of revenue. But all those benefits quickly change to this. Chinese real estate and that sector are coming to the forefront again. China's real estate crisis that is getting worse by the day. Beijing is <laughs> grappling with a mounting debt crisis. China's property crisis has suddenly accelerated once again. To understand why Chinese housing developers are drowning in debt and why the country's real estate market is on the edge of collapse, we should take a look at everything from the top. Let's start with the fact that the real estate sector in China is huge. China's real estate related industry is accounted for about 30% of GDP. You can't underestimate how important the property sector is to China. This literally means that real estate accounts for a third of the country's economy. To put it into perspective, this sector takes around 15% of American GDP. Later, you will understand why the importance of real estate in China is one of the major reasons for the collapse. The first thought that comes to mind is that the industry can only get this big only when it has great potential. Yet, in the case of China, this is only partially true. Four decades ago, China opened its economy to foreign investor and private businesses, triggering a massive migration to the big cities. Millions of people sought employment in factories. This surge in urbanization created a significant demand for housing, and as a result, it led to a construction boom. Before the 2008 crisis, the Chinese real estate industry was developing very rapidly, but the global economic situation slowed things down, and that was when the real estate bubble started to form. Average housing prices in China tripled from 2005 to 2009, this was influenced by government policies and the cultural peculiarities of the country. During this period, the so-called ghost cities began to appear. They take diverse forms and sizes. And once again, this isn't a rare thing. You can find these abandoned districts in approximately 50 towns. They're often referred to as development areas, new areas, or eco-cities. Kambashi stands out as one of the biggest and most prominent ghost cities. Initially planned to accommodate more than 1 million residents, today the city has only around 20,000 people residing there. Imagine entire neighborhoods of modern apartment buildings ready for people to move in, sitting empty for decades. It's kind of creepy, isn't it? And most of the units that you see behind me are actually still empty. The first logical question everyone has is why does something like this happen? The answer is pretty trivial. China has all these empty cities because of an oversupply of high priced housing on the market, which average Chinese families cannot afford. For example, China's average monthly housing price growth rate is about 7.8%. And in February 2010, there was a record growth of 25% in a month. On average, housing prices in China could grow even 90% in some years. And even though most people could not afford to buy a home, real estate developers kept building. And people still couldn't afford it. Yet, they still kept building. And eventually, all of this led to the ghost cities and the housing bubble. In 2010, China's real estate market became the largest in the world. And back then, no one wanted to stop. 
even though in 2014, the International Monetary Fund warned China that their excess of real estate could be harmful, especially in smaller cities. But this industry was driving the economy, and as long as the economy grows, everyone is satisfied. The sector became too big because it was bringing so much growth. There were already some signs of a potential real estate crisis in early 2016. To avoid it, the Chinese government implemented several measures, hoping they could boost property sales. They reduced taxes on buying a home, restricted land sales for new projects, and lower mortgage down payments. This helped a bit. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that real estate development usually works pretty similarly everywhere. There is a company which takes a loan to build something. Later, they sell the property, earn some money, and pay the loan back. But now, imagine real estate developers who take on debt to build new apartments, districts, or even whole cities. At some point, they're full of debt and no one buys their newly built properties. This was basically a quick recap of how China faced a new real estate crisis in 2020, also known as the Evergrande crisis. Over the past two years, dozens of Chinese real estate developers have fallen into financial distress. In August 2020, the Chinese government implemented the Three Red Lines Rule. Its aim was to control the high debt levels in the real estate development sector. This regulation set strict limits on borrowing. Basically, it assessed the real estate developer's debt limits using debt-to-cash, debt-to-equity, and debt-to-asset ratios. According to the rule, liabilities should not exceed 70% of assets, excluding income from pre-sold projects. Net debt should not exceed 100% of equity. Money reserves must be at least 100% of short-term debt. In short, it meant that developers could now take on much less debt. All that significantly affected Evergrande Group, the second largest property developer in China. As of 2021, Evergrande owned over 1,300 developments across 280 cities. The company borrowed a lot in the years before the three red lines policy appeared. That's why Evergrande was burdened with over $300 billion in total liabilities. And every year, that debt only got bigger. This is a story of the failure. The company itself was founded by Wei Kayan in 1996 in Sengzheng. Apart from real estate operations, Evergrande was engaged in construction, tourism, hospitality, theme park, healthcare, electric vehicles, sports, and entertainment. Such involvement in various business sectors has made Evergrande one of the largest Chinese companies and Huai Kayan the wealthiest person in China in 2017 with a net worth of $43 billion. But following the three red lines rule, which restricted lending to the real estate sector, Evergrande took action. The company sold 28% of its property management units for $3 billion and put its real estate on the market with large discounts. Everyone saw that the company was struggling, and global rating agencies, including Fitch and Moody's, downgraded Evergrande's outlook to negative. This made it more challenging for the struggling firm to secure borrowing. Public protests broke out outside Evergrande's headquarters in Shenzhen, and other locations across China. Angry investors and home buyers gather in frustration, demanding repayments. Yet, how much does Evergrande owe banks and creditors? By the end of 2022, Evergrande had over $341 billion in liabilities and 1,519 open legal cases involving $55.3 billion. Shares in the world's most indebted property company are back on sale, but investors aren't interested. Apart from Evergrande, other Chinese real estate development companies were at the center of the crisis. In total, over the past three years, more than 50 developers in China faced the same difficulties. For example, Country Garden announced a loss of up to $7.6 billion in 2023. Shares of Country Garden plummeted. This news led to a significant drop in the company's share price because investors were concerned about the potential for default on its large loans. 
Since 2021, we've seen about 40% or the companies that make up about 40% of China's housing sector default. Unpaid bills from Chinese developers amount to an estimated $390 billion, posing a significant economic threat. Both imports and exports have declined, and foreign investments were down over 80% from last year. You look at their import numbers, you look at their export numbers, all again, red negative. China's property market is facing a serious crisis. New home values continue to decline since the beginning of 2021, but sales don't really go up. You know, the prices have fallen much more sharply in Shanghai, in some downtown areas. This challenge coincides with the government's effort to change how the country's economy works. China is shifting from a economy driven by government-directed investments and exports to one where consumer spending takes the lead. Besides, the property are unaffordable for most despite the decline in housing prices and all the government initiatives. Depending on the province, the value of a home ranges from 5 to 18 times the median yearly family income. These prices significantly lower housing demand. That's why there's still a significant oversupply of construction projects in China. There are enough homes to house 200 million people, the equivalent to Brazil's population, but they're being withheld from the market as developers fear a price collapse. There are two other vital economic factors in China that contribute to the upcoming crisis. For one, Chinese youth unemployment is on the rise. It reached 21% in mid 2023. In comparison, this rate in the US is about 8%. And secondly, wage growth in China is luggish. In 2022, the average annual salary increased by only 3.7%, even though many claim that in the US, the salary growth is also low, but it is still almost twice as high compared to China. This slowdown in wage growth combined with the high unemployment rate among younger people impact the ability of Chinese youth to afford homes, influencing how confident people feel about their financial future. Consumer confidence has been declining uh, since the beginning of the year. Now, how does this affect the global economy? Why does it threaten to crush the real estate industry worldwide? I mean, let's think about it. When some of the largest housing developers have financial problems, it affects many people. But it isn't just that. Over the past 10 years, China has contributed over 40% to the global economic growth. It surpassed the US at 22% and the Eurozone at 9%. Thus, China's financial troubles have the potential to impact the global economy in several ways. First of all, it can impact global economic growth. Over the past decade, China was a significant driver of the world's economy, so its slowdown can have global effects. It will especially impact the economies that rely on China as a critical trading partner, but not only them, because China is too big to avoid. Besides, it is the world's leader in manufacturing, responsible for almost 30% of the total global output for producing goods. The U.S. takes the second place with around 16% of the manufacturing output worldwide. The second reason why the Chinese crisis can affect many more countries is the nature of international businesses. A decline in consumer spending in China could hurt companies globally. This will definitely, at least, affect American technology firms and European luxury good brands. If they reduce revenues and profits, they will have to compensate for that somehow. And the first solution is layoffs, which obviously isn't good for Americans or Europeans. The next reason why the global economy will respond to the changes in the Chinese economy is the decrease in commodity demand. As China is a large consumer of oil, mineral, and other industrial materials, an economic downturn can reduce the need for these commodities. As a result, it will affect global prices and markets. Finally, all these could have a trading impact. China is a big business partner for the U.S. and dozens of other countries, so changes in China's demand for American goods, including crops and machinery, can impact both exports and the trade balance. The risk associated with the fall of the Chinese property market can be much more significant than we think, even though things are happening on the other side of the ocean. 
everything could change at any moment, causing a domino effect. But there's no reason to panic. Just stay informed and remember that making risky deals in the face of a potential crisis might not be the best idea. Other than that, let's see how it goes. If something critical were to happen, we'll definitely let you know. I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.